invite you today to turn with me in your Bibles. We are in uh, the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going through the life of David. I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I'd like for you to turn with me over to verse 41. We'll be looking at several things in this chapter, but I want to read verses 41 through 58 to the end of the chapter. So let's stand together and read God's holy and inerrant word. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 41. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with a shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you had taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the armies of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. And then when it happened, when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face on the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Then he ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to Shamron, Even to Gath and Ekron, the sons of Israel gathered, returned from chasing the Philistines, and plundered their camps. And David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his weapons in his tent. Now when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? And Abner said, By your life, O king, I do not know. And the king said, You inquire whose son the youth is. So when David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse of the city of Bethlehem. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the power that we see in this passage of you taking a very young man, and using him to stop an entire army. And Father, we pray, we think about our own nation, and we think about, Lord, the uh, scourge in our land, the terrible scourge of our land of abortion. And Lord, this is something that we have legalized. It is something that we have allowed as a country. This is something that is being practiced even today and taking hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives. Children created in your image, those who are most defenseless, their lives are being taken freely. And Father, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask you would cleanse us of this sin. And Father, we pray for repentance as a nation. We pray, Lord, that you will turn this from our country. We pray, Lord, that you will do that even this year. And Lord, we pray that you would do something that no one thought David could destroy a giant. Lord, help us not to look to men, but help us to look to you. Help us to trust in what you can do, not what we might be able to do. 
Lord, all of us face great trials in our life. And we pray, Lord, that we would live by faith and not by sight. And we ask, O oh Lord, that we would learn the true lesson of this passage. That it would be a powerful lesson through the power of the Spirit in our life. And that truly our perspective would change. Our thought processes as we live by faith would change. And that, Lord, you would help us to have our minds renewed. And that we might truly begin to live more and more by faith and not by sight. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We all know this story. It's probably one of the most well-known stories in the scripture. The young man David facing the giant Goliath. We know the story, but the question is, have we learned the lesson? Let me ask you a question. Why is it with such great assurance that we can trust God for our eternal life and yet we continually struggle with trusting God in our daily life? Why is it that we can say with absolute certainty, yes, I know that I'm going to heaven and I'm going to heaven not because of myself, but because of what Christ Jesus has done on the cross for me. Why is it that we can have such assurance in trusting God for our eternal salvation, and yet we have so much difficulty trusting Him in our day-to-day -day life? How often is our mind consumed by worry? How often are we captivated by various fears? And how often do these fears, quite honestly, lead us toward disobedience in our life because we're not trusting God as we should? We don't know the origin of the Philistines. Some people think that they came from the Isle of Crete. They did not worship Yahweh. They did not worship the Lord God, the Lord of hosts. They worshiped Dagon who was half man, a grotesque figure, half man and half fish. That was their God. And they had come into the land of Israel, and they had settled in the coastal plain. And they lived in five very fortified cities, cities with names like Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, that's right, you know that city, Ekron, and Gath. And they had settled in those cities and they had fortified them and they controlled the whole coastal trading route that went through Israel. They had become masters of metallurgy and they were able to craft their weapons in a way far superior to what the Israelites had. They were able to incorporate iron into their swords and their shields and their chariots. And they controlled that so much during the time of Saul, that they did not allow any of the Israelites to be, have their own blacksmith. If you wanted to have, go to a blacksmith and have metal pounded, you had to go to the Philistines. This was their way of weapons control, if you were, in the land of Israel. And so Israel was living under the thumb of the Philistines, even while Saul was king. And what they would do is they would take raiding parties and they would go into the land of Israel and they would raid, they would slaughter, and they would plunder, and then they would go right back to their fortified cities, seal themselves up, and do this basically with that impunity, without any problem. And so they had made one of these raids into Israel, and now they were coming back, and Saul had lined up his forces against the Philistines. This is the Valley of Elah. It's south of Jerusalem. You can go there today. And it's a battlefield. It's used many times for battle. And on the southernmost part of that valley, you had the lines of the Philistines drawn up. And on the other side of that valley, on the other ridge, you had the lines of Israel drawn up. And what had happened is that the Philistines had decided that they wanted to battle, use this battle to destroy Israel, but they thought that they would do it in a different way. And this was done in combat in those times. They decided that they wanted a battle by proxy. 
and they had a champion that they could use that they would send forth before the people of Israel, and the agreement was this. If our champion wins, you become our slaves. If your champion wins, we'll become your slaves. And they had a champion. They had a champion who was a giant, and his name was Goliath. We read in Joshua chapter 11, verses 21 and 22, that Joshua conquered the promised land and he killed all the Anakim. That's the scripture's name for giants. But he did not kill those in the cities of Gaza and Gath and Ashdod. That's Joshua chapter 11. And here is a giant from the city of Gath. His name is Goliath. And based on the measures the scripture gives us, he is about nine feet, nine inches. You put a helmet on him, he's ten feet tall. For perspective, that means that when he stood, if he was standing in a basketball court, his head was even with the goal. That's how large he is. And he is covered with this armor that only the Philistines could make between them and the Israelites. They had developed this technology, this metallurgy, this ability to put iron into their armor. And so here he was standing with this what seemed like impregnable armor covering him from head to, ho to toe, helmet, shield, breastplate, armor on his legs, his javelin would have been possibly the size of a small telephone pole. The head of the javelin weighed 15 pounds. And to give you an understanding of basically what this means as we extrapolate this back, it means that his total body armor would be about 275 pounds. The average soldier at this time would have body armor of about 60 pounds. It's four times the strength of an average soldier. He has in front of him a shield bearer, and so his shield is such that he has a soldier that carries his shield for him into battle. And he stands in the valley of Elah, and he cries out to the people of Israel, and he taunts them. And he taunts their God because he is for Dagon. He doesn't believe in the Lord of hosts. He doesn't believe in Yahweh, the God of the people of Israel. And he taunts them. And he does this one day, he does this two days, he does this three days, he does this four days, he does this five days, he does this for 40 days. And where is God's champion? Nowhere to be found. Because there is no heart for God. And the people of Israel, the soldiers of Israel, see Goliath standing in the valley. Their response is this. You see it in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 17. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. That word means shattered. That's to be so frightened that you're shattered. Have you ever been that frightened? Just completely, you go to pieces, what the word means. And then it says, very importantly, they were greatly afraid. And this word means to shake. It means to have tremors. It means to be struck with dread. And so they flee. They pull back. No one's willing to go into the army, into the center of the battle. No one's to leave the ranks of the army and go into the valley of Elah. And Saul's desperate. He offers a lot. He's a desperate man. He needs a champion. And so he offers several things. He offers wealth. 
he offers the hand of his daughter in marriage, which means that whoever defeated this enemy would become part of the royal family. And he feels so generous and he is so desperate, he says, you won't even have to pay taxes anymore in your life. No one would go. David's brother, Eliab, his older brother, would not grow. He was a strong and powerful person, someone that Samuel thought would certainly be the next king of Israel. He would not go. Abner would not go into the valley. The captain of Saul's army, Abner, certainly a gifted soldier, would not go. We're not told about Jonathan in this passage, but if Jonathan was there with his father Saul, he would not go into the valley, and certainly he was a courageous person. Levites and the priest, not go. But most importantly, Saul would not go. The scripture tells us that Saul was head and shoulders in height above any other person in Israel. And he was the king. Why wouldn't he go? Well, there's something interesting here. I want you to look with me in verse 11. It says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now look at that word, greatly afraid. And then slowly turn back with me a few chapters in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 12. And in 1 Samuel chapter 12, Samuel is speaking to the people of Israel. They have decided to move away from God being their immediate ruler and king, and they've wanted an earthly king. They've gotten Saul. And Samuel says, in light of that, listen to this. Listen to verses 13 and 14. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen, whom you have asked for. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. And listen to his words now. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and listen to his voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. And then look at verse 24 of the same chapter. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. The word that is used for the fear of the Lord is the same word through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that is used in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and the connection is clear and the connection is obvious that the people of Israel were giving to Goliath and his power the fear that only God deserved. They were giving to Goliath the fear and reverence that God had called for them to give to him and to give to him alone. Fear was controlling their life. And it was fear of such a nature that it bordered on worship. It bordered on worship. So the question is, who will stand for God? Will anyone stand for God? Or will all of Israel turn their back and run back toward their, their forts and their cities? Who will stand for God? Let's look at some characteristics of the one who stands for God in this passage. The first is this, is that those who stand for God are led by God. Those who stand for God are led by God. David, he's a young man. He's between 13, 15 years old, the best that we can understand. He's not ready for warfare in man's eyes. And so he's out tending the sheep. And Jesse hasn't heard from his sons. His three sons who are out in battle. He has eight sons, but he has three that are out campaigning with Saul in battle. And he hasn't heard from them. And so he calls David and he says, Come, I'm going to give you some bread. I'm going to give you some roasted grain. I want you to take it 
to Eliab and the rest of the boys. I've got some cheese for you that I'm going to give you, and you take the cheese to their commander, make sure everything's good there. And you find out for me how things are going in the field, and you come back and talk with me. David doesn't know what's going on in the Valley of Elah. He doesn't know that there's this champion that is taunting the people of God. He just simply following his father's instructions. And he goes to the battle. He goes to the battle. David comes and he sees that the armies are drawn up against each other. And as he meets his brothers, Goliath makes his daily foray into the valley of Elah and taunts and ridicules the army of the people of God and ridicules the living God himself. And so God providentially places David in a situation where he will face this enemy of God himself. It is not an easy place. It's not a safe place. It's not a happy place. And quite honestly, David, by trusting in God, will go to far worse places that will be more difficult even than this in his life. Let me ask you, do you believe that God places you where you are? Do you believe that you live under the providence of God? Or do you believe that you live by chance? That's about the two choices. Where do you believe that you live? Do you see God guiding you? Because sometimes when he guides, it's not going to be a safe place. Sometimes when he guides, it's not going to be an easy place. Sometimes when he guides, it may not be a happy place. But it's the place that God places you. Do you see God's providence in your life? And do you see these providences as God leads you as opportunities to trust Him? Do you see your life from that perspective? Secondly, those who stand for God will face criticism. David asked the question in this chapter. He says, um, who is this Philistine? saying these things about our people. And more importantly, who is this Philistine saying these things about our God? We read in verse 28 of chapter 17, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, uh, Why have you come down? You can hear the older brother condescending to the younger brother. Why have you come down here? You have no business here. Why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You see? <laughs> what a shot. You're not important, and be quite honest, what you do at home isn't important. What are you doing here? This is men's work. This is war. Why are you showing your face around here? He says, I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you, for you have come down in order to see the battle. No football games in those times. You've come down here for the game. You've come here to see the battle. You freeloader. You need to be back at home watching those few sheep that God, that our fathers put you in charge of. And David said, what have I done now? Look at those words. <laughs> Was it not just a question? He had taken that before. He will face criticism by Saul as well. Saul will tell him he's not experienced enough to face Goliath. And certainly he will face criticism by Goliath who will call him a dog and ask him, have you come out to fight me with sticks? The 
If we're going to serve the Lord, we will be criticized. We have men who are about to be ordained and some who have already ordained and they'll be installed as officers in this church. And when you become an officer in the church, you put a target on your back. You will be criticized. That's part and parcel of the calling. It's the nature of ministry. Are you willing to stand up to the criticism? Because if you stand for God, there's a great possibility that you're not going to be applauded. You're going to be criticized if you stand for God. Thirdly, those who stand for God will face overwhelming odds. Humanly speaking, there are no odds of God. But humanly speaking, those who stand for God will face overwhelming odds. Very rarely in Christian endeavor has the normal, natural situation been in favor of God's people. And if we're waiting to do something for God in which everything lines up in our life to act for God and to do for God, then probably we won't ever act. How often are Christian ministries and churches shipwrecked because those who lead it are always looking for the fair weather to sail? They always look through the prism of Goliath at what is going on. In Jerusalem, if there had been odds makers who were fingering their abacuses trying to count their beads and bets, it'd probably be 300 to 1 that Goliath would win, 400 to 1 that Goliath would win, and the one... And the reason those odds would be that low is because they would think there is a slight possibility that Goliath would hurt himself when he went into battle. Only David did not look at Goliath. He looked at God. Only David. David knew there was no such thing as odds when it came to God. This is Pro-Life Sunday, and I'll share this. I've shared it before, but and it says nothing of anyone but the Lord. But when Sally and I had our first child, we lost the first child a few minutes after birth, and we had a genetic problem, the child out of a syndrome, you know, so cure. And we went to a geneticist at the University of Mississippi, and we sat down with him, and he had our records, and he looked at them, and there was a, a one in four possibility that any child that we had would die shortly after birth. And he was the authority I guess, in the state of Mississippi. And he said that if you get pregnant again, I advise you to have an abortion. And so we went back to our car, and we sat down and we cried. Because we had lost our first child, and it sounded like we might not be able to have any other children. We knew we would not have an abortion. And we cried and we prayed and we talked. And I simply said to Sally, we talked, and I said, there are no odds with God. It doesn't matter what they say. We'll trust the Lord. He's given us two children. Now, very clearly, something different could have happened. We could have lost every child that we conceived after that. But that's not what happened. There are no odds with God. If you're going to stand for God, you will face overwhelming odds. And on that day, one of the greatest moments 
in the history of Israel occurred. It was about a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And David goes out in the field and he gathers five smooth stones. And if you're wondering why he gathers five smooth stones, you can read 2 Samuel chapter 21 through 2 Samuel chapter 24. And David is going into the field with a full knowledge and the possibility that he must slay four, for Goliath has four sons. He picks up five stones. David is confident in the Lord. And the Philistine comes on the field, and David begins to run. He begins to run. The scripture says, quickly. The word that is used, David ran quickly toward the battle line. David isn't hesitating. He is sprinting toward his enemy. And if we had been standing close enough, we could have heard the twirl of the sling as it was going through the air in the movement of David's body, all of it in harmony together as he had done probably hundreds of times before. And he knows where he needs to be. He takes the initiative away from Goliath. And he gets to the point where he needs to be and he unloads. And the rock goes, can go between 60 to 100 miles an hour. It's interesting that an extremely skillful Roman archer would practice at 200 yards. An extremely gifted slingman in the Roman army practiced at 400 yards. That's how deadly someone who was skillful with a sling was. And David lands just exactly where he's aiming, at the head of Goliath. And Goliath comes down. He falls face first. What does that tell you? It tells you he's out as he falls. God has raised up a warrior who did not depend on a sword or a spear, or even an arrow, but a projectile slung from a sling. The weapon was unaccounted for by the Philistines with their advanced armor. With one shot, he's a dead man. David did this because he trusted in the Lord, because he did not look at Goliath. He looked at God. Fourthly, those who stand for God live by faith. David believed that God was worthy of his trust. I believe that when Saul sent David into battle, I have a good feeling, I can't say this, and I don't want to put things in Scripture that's not there, but I have a good feeling that when David went into battle, Saul was looking for his horse. Because I don't think Saul thought that David would walk off that field. I thought he had someone who could go on the field, he could say, we did have a champion, it didn't work out, and we got out of there. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I know this. I know that David knew in his heart that he could take down Goliath. How do we know this? There's a wonderful lesson that is for us as we seek to live by faith. If you would turn with me to 1 Samuel 17, verses 33. Through 39. I want you to see something that's very, very important as we walk by faith and how God can build our faith. It's wonderful to see and learn this lesson from a 13 to 15 year old young man, certainly who's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it's wonderful to see this in his life at this age. Verse 31, when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. And then verse 32 of 1 Samuel 17, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. 
your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. And your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. And so David outlines for Saul why he believes that the God will deliver him from the hand of Goliath. Saul's response in verse 38 is as though David hasn't said a word about God. Saul says, Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. David is talking about trusting in the Lord, and Saul is talking about trusting in his armor. It's as though David has given nonsense gibberish in front of Saul because he's talked about God. And Saul trusts in his armor, and he says, Here, after you said all that, take this, and maybe it will help you. A friend of mine in Mississippi, Lynn Sprecher, served in World War II on uh, the U.S. Brownson. It was a destroyer in the Pacific. It sank. And the morning that that ship sank with Lynn on it, he was in the radio room. They heard... Uh, they were, of course, the first ones to hear through radio that there were uh, bombers coming in. And he turned to his uh, chief, who he worked under, and he shared the gospel with him. And his chief looked at him, smiled, and said, I'll tell you what I trust in, Sprecher. And he patted his life vest. He said, this is what I trust in. And Lynn never saw that man alive again. Men, women, boys and girls, we can trust in our own armor. But it's insufficient. It's insufficient for the day. Then look at David's response in verse 39. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And so David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. Now here's so important. For I have not tested them. And David took them off. David says, I'm not wearing this arm because I haven't tested it. But you know who he had tested? He had tested God. And that's who he trusted in. That's who he put his confidence in. And what David is doing in this passage is giving to us a model that he will relate to us throughout the book of Psalms. There is no one in Scripture that uses the word remember. There is no one in Scripture that uses and calls the people of God to remember more what God has done in the past as David. That's a mark of his life. You see it already in his life here as a young man, and you see it in his life as he grows into maturity as a king, how can we grow in our faith? By stopping and remembering what God has done for us. Basing our life upon His Word and upon His promises and how we have seen those promises fulfilled in our life again and again and again and again. How God has changed our life through Christ do we really think about how deeply our lives would be different if we did not know Christ? Do we think about how God has provided for us in unusual ways? How God has restored relationships around us? How God has renewed us in a certain area of life? How God has changed a person's life that we prayed for and maybe shared our faith with? Do we remember those works of God in our life? and treat them as precious, and hold them as dear, because they will build our faith. 
And that is exactly what David is doing here. He says, I have been at war before, not with Goliath, but with lions and with bears. And I've seen God deliver me over and over again. And I take that faith now and I go into battle. When our church first started, when not when we our church first started, but when I got here, the church had been here for ten years. There was an elder who served on our session and served a number of terms. And when we get in a difficult situation, that elder would say, "I can hear his word." Men, are we trusting God? Do we not believe that God can't be trusted? Trust the Lord. And he said that again and again. I can't tell you how that encouraged me as a pastor. If you're going to stand for God, you're going to have to do it by faith. By faith. And certainly, those who stand for God stand ultimately for the glory of God. That's why they do what they do. And so look with me, if you will, at what David says in verse 45. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This is why David goes into battle. He doesn't go into battle for treasure. He doesn't go into battle for the hand of Saul's wife. He doesn't doesn't go into battle so he can avoid taxes for the rest of his life. He goes into battle because this man is defaming the name of the living God and he will not have it. That's why he goes into battle. The name of God is more important to David than anything. God's glory. God's glory. You know, there is one greater that has stood with David. He stood for David. He stands for us. David won this battle. The Philistines fled, and an entire army was defeated by David's action in the field that day. There's one far greater than David who has gone into the field for us. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has stood, and he has defeated sin and death, and he has done that for his people. His one action on the cross affects the lives of all of his people. And the question is, how can you be one of his people? You can be one of his people by recognizing how serious your sin is before God, a holy God, and by turning from your sin in repentance and turning toward Christ and Christ alone by faith as your Savior, forgive you of your sins and use your Lord to cleanse you, make you righteous before Him. Do you know Christ? Do you know that one who has stood in proxy for us? The one on whose behalf we come and by whose strength we come to God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your work through this young man, David. We thank you for his faith. We thank you for his trust in you. We ask, Lord, that we might live more by faith. We pray, Lord, that instead of worries and fears and doubts, all of which lead to disobedience, that, Lord, we would stop being led by fear and we would begin being led by you, by looking to you in faith and trust. Help us as the Scripture commands us to fill our minds, to remember all of your great work, and specifically, Lord, the work that you have done for us in your Son and the work that you have done for us in our life as we have lived our Christian life. We ask, Lord, that you would give us minds that would remember Father, we pray that we would be people of faith, not of fear. And Father, we pray today for any soul here who does not know Christ. 
We pray that they would stand with Christ today. We pray, Father, that they would see the depth of their sin. They would understand that they stand not as friends of God, but enemies of God because of their sin. And that, Lord, that they would repent. They would surrender their heart and their will to Christ. And they would fully and completely embrace him by faith trusting in him alone as the sole source of salvation. Through your spirit, O Lord, awaken their heart that they might abandon themselves and trust in Christ, to cling to him. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May we stand for the benediction. And now may God's grace and his mercy and his peace Be with us both now and forevermore. Amen.